like to do this morning in the two sessions is to talk first about ants, uh, since that's uh, always a, a topic of interest. But uh, then want to talk about avoiding pesticide runoff in urban waterways. And, and that, in the last five or ten years, I, I spend almost, I would say, 80 percent of our time, our research effort, in trying to prevent that. And, and again, we'll talk more about that. It's uh, become really a, a, a passion with me. Then I want to talk about termites. This is a subject that, that I probably get at least a call a week, if not more. Uh, that's why I typically don't answer my phone anymore. <laughs> so now that I'm retired, I don't have to answer my phone. And finally, then I uh, want to talk about uh, a, a new invasive cockroach, the Turkestan cockroach, and a project one of my undergraduate students, she, she had been working on this for two or three years. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about it, and I'm sure that uh, you, you might have seen this uh, uh, new uh, insect. So ants, you know, ants uh, belong to the family Firmicidae. Uh, as you can see, they're probably right now identified in the world about 12,000 different species. So if you go to the tropics, so just thousands of different uh, kinds of ants. Uh, if you look at the biomass, if you were just to go to weigh all of the insects, 15% of the biomass in the tropics are ants. So if you weigh elephants and all of these other big animals, 15% of the total weight are ants. So it's really a, you know, an important group you know, worldwide. California, there are about 270 species. Probably only about 15 are actually important from, a, from our urban standpoint as pests. Again, they've been around a long, long time. And, and they got their name Firmicity because many of them produce a formic acid as their defense. So they'll bite and then squirt the formic acid in, and that causes the owie. And, uh, but again, here you can see uh, one of the infamous uh, bulldog ants here uh, from Australia. But uh, I just want to quickly go through a few of the, what I consider to be the major ant pest in California. The Argentine ant, of course, uh, and, and then maybe the southern fire ant. Here in San Diego, along the coastal areas, uh, the odorous house ant uh, is still quite a bit of a problem. Velvety tree ant in the inland areas, especially in trees and uh, around homes that have a lot of trees. A feral ant, and then the three on the bottom I put in red because these are invasive species. In other words, these are non-native to California, but have uh, become uh, established and are going to be major pests uh, throughout the state. Red imported fire ant, rover ants, and most recently, just in the last month or two, the big-headed ants that have appeared uh, in Orange County. So if, if these become established, they'll quickly, uh, uh, I think, get into the San Diego area. And uh, you begin seeing them. <clears throat> Now, they're, they're going to make this uh, available uh, online, so you don't need to worry about copying all of these sites down. But this one here is a, it is a great one here. It's a, essentially a, a key. In other words, with a hand lens and whatnot, you can actually uh, sit down and work your way through this and actually identify you know, the 10 or 15 most important pest species uh, in the urban environment. This is a, a, an absolutely wonderful site here. This uh, is uh, Ant Web in California, and it's a site where you can actually go and there are pictures of what these ants look like. So if you know what ant you're interested in, let's say the Argentine ant, or you're interested in the harvester ants, or what, you can actually go on the site and there's just all kinds of information. It's a little on the technical side, but they were really great pictures. I mean, it is just a tremendous website. So, so again, this, this is one if you're interested in ants, you want to be aware of. Now, if you're just interested in urban insects of California, you know, you know millipedes or centipedes, or you know, want information about bees or wasps or all kinds of things, this particular site that we have here, this is Walter Edling's book, Urban Entomology. It's no longer you know, in press, there's only about 5,000 copies that were made. So again, pretty hard to get a hold of it. But the whole book is, is up online, so you can actually get into the chapters there. So if you want to know something about cockroaches, or fire brats, or silverfish, uh, rodents, mice, whatever, this, this, this is a great, 
great site. So here are three really nice online resources you know, that are available to you. And then there's a, a, a publication that a colleague and myself and a few other people put together that's uh, available uh, from uh, ANR Catalog Services. This is Urban Pest Management of Ants in California. So again, helps identify biology of the different ants and whatnot, and then different uh, the strategies for, for controlling some of these ants. And again, with a lot of insects, uh, once we know what the problem is, then you can often design an IPM type of approach to control it. But the first thing you have to do is, is be able to figure out what the ants actually are. So this is the, the number one pest probably in the state of California. It's the Argentine ant. Uh, this, uh, you know, uh, we've been involved with surveys with, uh, with Lloyd's Pest Control here. And in the San Diego area, about 90% of the time, when you encounter an ant in the urban environment, it's going to be this particular ant. Again, the ants uh, are uh, all uniform in size, and we'll, we'll bring that to contrast here in a minute. In other words, all of the workers, all of the female workers are the same size. They're all typically a, a light brown to a dark brown. They're sweet-feeding ants, so they're going to be tending, you know, mealybugs, aphids, other types of uh, insects that you find you know, on a lot of the plants uh, around the household area. Again, it is an invasive ant that came into California and the United States uh, at, the, at, the, at the turn of the 20th century. It uh, probably came into New Orleans and quickly spread throughout the southeast and into uh, the west. They bite but don't sting. But the, the hallmark feature here is that they prefer sweets and honeydew. So you're going to find them primarily feeding you know, on, on sugar types of, of, of sources. They're not really protein feeders. So in making baits or using baits or whatnot, typically uh, the most effective baits are what we call sweet liquid baits. They really don't feed on solids or solid baits at all. They form extensive trails. They have really shallow, shallow nests. In other words, the nest will only go maybe an inch or two down into the soil. So it's not very deep. So. If you get a flooding situation or we get a lot of rain, which doesn't happen very often, the ants will just abandon those nests and they'll get up and pull the wall void often or they'll move indoors. But uh, typically, as soon as the, those conditions are alleviated, the ants will move back outside. This ant does not really nest indoors very often. And, and so the control measures or whatever we're going to do are primarily going to be done outside with this particular ant. Again, very high moisture requirements. This ant is from Argentina, uh, along the uh, river plains of Argentina. So it's going to be found in areas with high and excessive moisture around the structure. So again, if we can prevent that kind of situation, if you can you know, prevent the drippers and whatnot from leaking, if you can prevent water from accumulating, often that in itself is enough to help reduce the nesting. The ant that looks very much like it in this area is the odorous house ant. This is a native ant species. We find that along the coast, in fact, when we were doing some projects over at the Camp Pendleton, this, this is the first native ant that you find. You find this first, and then in areas, the Argentine ant have actually displaced this ant. So the Argentine is sort of pushing out the odorous house ant. Again, look very, very similar. Uh, a dark brown to black color. But the way that I tell these apart very quickly, you can tell them apart very quickly, if you just crush the ant in, in your finger, just pick up one and crush it. As the name would indicate, there's a really pungent rotten odor to this, a rotten coconut odor. And then you know you have odorous house ant. Now, what's important about that is that this particular species will nest indoors in potted plants, we often find it in, in a shower stall. If you find it, you know, in your shower room or whatnot, you find the ants trailing in there. This is the species that's likely to do that. It'll nest actually in the wall void. And so that, you know, you have to take that uh, into account. Often find them like under a dishwasher where there's some extra moisture. So again, you know, recognizing the difference, you know, does this have the potential to nest indoors? Do I need to do an indoor type of treatment? or an outdoor treatment. 
One thing nice about this particular species is the colonies don't get very large, so that often baiting is very effective against this particular ant. Where it's against Argentine ants, it's, it's more of a, a war of attrition and uh, you know, how persistent you're going to be with your baiting. But again, so that's a, one that you'll, a pair of ants that you'll find here. One that we find more and more often as we look around, especially if you get into inland areas like Escondido, get into the inland areas here where it's a little bit drier, is this velvety tree ant. A pretty large ant, you can see that it's up to four, it's twice the size of the Argentines, has that blackish uh, uh, abdomen here, and the, the velvet on that are just hairs. This is where it gets its name from. But again, these typically nest in trees or underneath trees or whatnot, or found in trees, but they will forage and move indoors. And sometimes we'll find them, you know, in, in bathrooms, shower stall areas, and people will think that they're actually carpenter ants, but, but they're not really. The, the main nest is typically outdoors. Like the Argentines, again, this is another one of these sweet feeding ants. And again, it's important to remember that ants, um, they have a very, very small esophagus swallowing. They can only swallow liquids, the workers. The little female workers can only swallow liquid, liquids. So typically on these sweet feeding ants, when we go to bait or whatnot, we almost always try to go with a, a sugar-based liquid bait. Uh, again, solid baits simply uh, are not very uh, effective. These will bite. Uh, it's a fairly painful bite. So again, uh, again uh, in, in the more inland areas, uh, especially where we have more native habitats and uh, you know, where we're growing native plants and trying to, to, to our, do our xeric landscaping and whatnot. This, this California harvester ant uh, uh, is a problem. Again, they're very easy to recognize. They have this little, what we call, cinamophore here. What these are are these little hairs underneath the head. This allows the, the female to carry seeds. So if she's out harvesting seeds from the weed plants and everything, she stuffs them in this cinamophore, and then she takes them back to the nest, and then they'll actually store those and then use those uh, at, at a later time uh, to feed the uh, developing workers. Again, this is the one that, you know, if you buy the Uncle Milty ant farm, this, this is the species they give you. They give you workers. They don't give you any reproductives. They give you the workers, so for about a month or two, you have, you know, ants in your... Uncle Milty's farm, and then uh, they all sort of die off over time. But these, uh, you have to be a little cautious with these. These do have a stinger, and they can really give you a wallop. So, you know, I've, I've been the recipient of these before, so I, I can guarantee you it hurts. It hurts. You'll, you'll, you'll remember this thing long, long after. In fact, the venom in this is more toxic than rattlesnake venom. It's just that you don't get very much. You just get a little teeny bit. But it's enough. You get stung once, you'll, you'll remember it for a long time. Um, this is one that uh, in, in the San Diego area and around, especially around military bases and whatnot, that, that's pretty prevalent. This is the sparrow's ant. This is one of the indoor pest species. A very, very tiny ant. You can see that they're less than two millimeters long. Very, very light colored. And they nest indoors, typically behind uh, electrical sockets. They're often found in kitchen areas. You find them out foraging on sweet or on fats and, and uh, oils and, and uh, more protein type of material. And uh, like I say, these uh, get moved around uh, because they do nest indoors. So, you know, with all of the military movement of goods between here and Hawaii and all of these other places and whatnot, that this is a pretty common uh, ant in certain circumstances. And again, this is one that, again, also baiting is an excellent approach, but here you would use one of the baits that is more of a protein or fat-based bait, and uh, uh, it uh, is pretty effective in controlling the species. The native species that looks much like it is called the thief ant. In fact, right now, to, to my wife's chagrin, uh, I have a have a colony of thief ants that's swarming in the bathroom, and, oh. and they're bringing up the alates. And I, my wife wants to spray them. See, she's like, I want to kill these. I said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. 
Because they're, they're getting ready to swarm and they're bringing the new queens and kings up. Oh, Jesus. And so I've been collecting those. But this isn't, go, this isn't going over well. You know, she brought me this last night. She was working at the computer and one of those female queens landed on the computer screen. But again, they're very, very tiny. And I told her, you know, these... These are really interesting ants. And you, they, they, they get their name thief ant because they, they live in, in conjunction with other ants. And what they do is they're very tiny and they hide themselves in tiny tunnels. And as the other ants go by with food, they run out and grab it and steal it. And that's where they get their name thief ant from. And so they're really pretty cool ants. But again, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of these things. You know, It's trying to convince her that no, we'll just let them swarm here, you know, in the bathroom here so we can collect some more ants. But yeah, really uh, an interesting ant. Often, if, if this is a problem, you'll see it around if people are feeding, uh, ant, you know, feeding their pets outside. They, they love things like pet food, dog food, cat food. They like that protein, that oily type of material. So, you know, this and the, and the feral ant are, are some that uh, feed on, uh, on those kinds. Another native ant, the southern fire ant, very, very common in this area, especially um, uh, in, in, in uh, what I would say, uh, oh, in sort of disturbed areas around home where it's a little bit drier, or a little bit more native in its, uh, its composition, it's not getting a lot of irrigation or watering. This is one that uh, is often found. Now notice all of the ants that we've talked about up to now all of the ants have been of the same size, what we call monomorphic. All of the ants are about two or three millimeters long. But here are some of the ants. You can see they, they range from about a, a millimeter and a half to six millimeters. So they're polymorphic. So that helps you actually identify the ants. Uh, it, it is when you're working through these keys, uh, it uh, is uh, uh, one of the ways to identify them. Very, very common around here. We've spent a lot of time trying to protect the California least tern populations, you know, down on Coronado and, and on the Navy bases from this particular ant because they'll actually chew a hole through the eggshell and, and feed on the, the little chick egg, or the, the little chicks are on the nest, they'll actually, actually attack the mm -hmm. chicks. But, Again, but uh, this is one where we've been able to develop some baiting strategies. And again, this is a protein type of feeder. It's not a liquid bait feeder. So, you know, when you think about ants, there are going to be a group of ants that you approach them with liquid baits, and there'll be a group of ants where you approach them with solid baits. So this is one of the solid bait ants. And again, pretty omnivorous. This is, a, I'm sure you've seen these around. They have this typical around weeds and whatnot, and you have to pile up soil and everything, and if you stomp on this, they'll, they'll actually come out for a minute or two and be pretty aggressive, but they usually retreat right away. This is the native species, but this is that imported species. This is in from probably, you know, Texas in the southeast. Again, also from the same place in Argentina where the Argentine ants came from. And uh, they came into the United States, uh, into Mobile and uh, New Orleans back about 19, probably 1930s, and have rapidly spread. And again, like that southern fire ant, notice that they go anywhere from being fairly small ants to, to relatively large ants. They get their name because of this really potent sting. And uh, again, uh, these uh, can really, uh, uh, really inflict some uh, uh, fairly uh, uh, painful uh, bites and stings. Uh, the ant, uh, she uh, grabs a hold of you with her mandibles and then she turns around and begins stinging you and oh, putting the venom in. So, but again, it usually takes time. So usually you can get the ant off before she actually does any damage to you. But uh, again, you have to be a little on the quick side. And here you can see the high-risk areas uh, of RIFA throughout the state. Initially, the, you know, the Department of Food and Agriculture thought that they were going to be able to get a handle on this and prevent it from getting established, but uh, unfortunately, we didn't. And uh, like I say, we, I find them all over campus now, all over parts of Riverside, Orange County. I'm, I'm sure they're down here now, and, and uh, they'll continue to spread. Uh, again, uh, this uh, brown area here uh, shows their extent. In, in agriculture, you often find them in, uh, in, in almonds, uh, grapes, and other things like that. They like to tend insects. They like to also feed on sugar and honeydew. So 
you know, they'll take care of mealybugs and whatnot, and uh, much like the Argentina ant. Now, one of the easy ways to, to, to identify the problem here is by their nesting habits. The southern fire ant, which is our native species, they like these disturbed areas with sparse vegetation. I often find them, you know, right at the base of, 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 of different kinds of weeds that are growing in the... They like non-irrigated areas, and they have these low uh, mounds of loose soil, whereas the red imported fire ant has a high moisture content. Again, it comes from that part of Argentina, where the Argentine ant came from. So they're heavily irrigated, and they build up these, these big mounds. And the, and the other way you can tell is, all you have to do is stomp next to the mound. If the ants come out and they go away, then you have southern fire ant. If they don't go away and they attack you, then you know, yeah, it's this one. You know, immediately you, know, you have the other species. So, you know, you, you don't need to identify. The two ants are, are virtually, you, you can't tell them apart, even with a hand lens. You actually have to take the head off and actually look at the structure on, on the forehead. So, you know, I, I find I find the behavioral identification much quicker, and uh, it's a pretty pretty reliable way of doing it. Now, here's our our newest uh, invader to California, and this is going to be a serious problem if it really truly establishes and spread. It's called big headed ant, Bigoli megacephala. And, and the reason you can see here, here's one of the small workers, and here's one of the large female workers. And look at the size of the head here. This is where it gets this uh, name from here. And again, it's an invasive species. Uh, it, uh, it's a pest in agriculture as well as urban. It's uh, now well established in Florida, and it is simply displacing most of the other ants in the urban areas and has become really the number one pest in southern Florida. It's replaced the red imported fire ant as the major pest species there. Uh, it uh, is originally from the island of Maritasis in the Indian Ocean area. How in the world it spread? Probably through you know, commerce and travel and, and from ships. Again, uh, sometimes uh, it's mistaken actually for termites because it will build these, uh, these uh, sand or, or, or mud tubes to cover itself. But again, another feature of it here uh, is uh, underneath the tile here, a lot of debris and insect parts and other things underneath, uh, which is often a good sign that, uh, that, that it is an ant problem. But you might want to keep your uh, eye out for this. Uh, uh, you know, there, there are lots of native Fidoli in, in California, maybe 15 or 20 species. But, you know, I have a project where uh, Terry Bishop at Oregon, he collects ants, and I collect ants from urban centers all over the state. And we rarely find Fidoli. Fidoli, this ant native, is typically found out in the chaparral or in native areas. You typically don't find it urban. So I have a sense if you begin seeing this ant and whatnot, that uh, that it's going to be this uh, big-headed ant. Mm -hmm. When you say they uh, replace, do you mean that they kill the other species? Oh, yeah. They out yeah, the, like Argentine ant is one of those. They just literally out-compete mm -hmm. them at a resource. It's like, you know, the old general forest, you know, the Confederates used to say, the firstest with the mostest. Whoever gets there the first with the most usually wins the competition battle. So, yeah, and these, these are pretty vicious. There's not just two large populations for one out. No, they'll, they'll, they'll eliminate everything else. So, you, so like in the Argentine, you know, in, in a native situation like down here, when, when like over at Camp Pendleton where we have a native ant complex, I'll go out in the beach area where we're working on the turns and we'll have like 12 or 14 different species of ants actually all living sort of together. If the Argentine ants are in the area, there's only Argentine ants. They, they don't tolerate living with anyone else. Yeah, th this is the problem with these kinds of invasive species. Some of them have the ability to essentially <laughs> displace, you know, the natural setup. So what about control types of, of strategies and you know, things that, that people can do? And, and usually I break them down into these three, or like habitat modification, then the chemical sprays, granular treatments, and whatnot, and then, and then third baits. I mean, these are usually, you know, some of the approaches 
that can be taken here to get control. So like under the path modification, removing nesting sites, and some, some suggestions and whatnot. I mean, if we have situations where you have velvety tree ant or carpenter ant, you know, the places they like to nest are in, in logs, wood, uh, you know, people are using railroad ties, you know, and, and they're decorative. These are the kinds of places where this ant likes to nest. Other is uh, removing vegetation from the sides of buildings or, or roofs. One of the major highways into structures for carpenter ants, velvety tree ants is, is not low. They like to actually go up in the tree and then just drop off onto the roof and they'll go right into the attic. So getting that, that vegetation off of the roof. I, again, in our area, you know, and in southern Florida, you know, one of the major places that you find ants are in the palms and whatnot. They love, they love to nest in, in, in the palms and trees. Again, they're, they're looking, remember, for, for mealybugs. They're looking for aphids. You know, they're looking for those uh, homopterous types of insects that produce honeydew. And, and they'll actually farm them. It, it's an actual farming operation. They'll, they'll protect them. They move them around. They, they you know, it, it, it's their, you know, it, it's their little farm that they take care of. And so they, again, eliminating food sources. So like, like around my house, the, the plant that they love to tend are impatience. Impatience gets some aphids and stuff on it. Ants just love to tend that. So, you know, so you, you just need to, you know, do some of your plant control. So mm -hmm. the Argentinians, aren't they in the ground? Well, they're in the ground. As I mentioned, they have a really shallow nest. So that they might be under a rock or they might be nesting. Like Dig it up or disturb it, or you could do that. You, 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 yeah, you could treat that. You could actually go to the nest sites uh, around the home. Often there'll be fifteen or twenty different nest sites. Pot, <laughs> yeah, you could do that. You could you could use boiling water. Uh, I mean, you know. Well, diatomaceous earth. You know, people. You know, it, it it's like so so. The problem with diatomaceous earth is that, you know, the idea behind it is that the diatomaceous earth <coughs> removes the wax from the surface of the insect, and then the insect desiccates or dehydrates. And so that's why it's not really toxic to humans or to vertebrates. But ants are, are you know, they typically are, are repelled by things like that. They know that it's a desiccant, and they will be reluctant to walk on it. So, yeah, if you get the nest treated, that's one thing, but to use it as a uh, as sort of as a preventative, it, it usually doesn't work well. Boiling water. Yeah, boiling water. Like I say, you know, my, my wife would refer to a rain can. You know, <laughs> she, she's more gratified by instant death. <laughs> and so, but I, you know, well, boiling water is pretty quick too. But but yeah, soaps. Anything that would disrupt the cuticle. Uh -huh. yeah. On the impatience, the shade of the New Guinea, or does it not make a difference? No, you know, New Guinea, I don't find them on that very as much. It's the other ones. Yeah, it's not so much the New Guinea impatience. So uh, do they prefer shady, wet areas? Oh, absolutely. Again, remember, these Argentine ants have high water requirement, and so they're going to go to places that, that, that are really moist. And... Um, you know, you, you might find them out in, in the native habitat, like I've, I've got native plants around mine, and they'll be out there nesting, but they're close enough, they're within 25 feet of a dripper or something where they can get water. Yeah, the, the, but yeah, they, they won't go huge distances where they can't get the water. So yeah, if you can limit the moisture, yeah, then that, that will be another thing that you're eliminating. So again, like I say, these are impatient. I, you know, it's sort of strange, I've got like, well, I think maybe 38 different varieties of, of hybrid teas, but only two of them actually attract the ants. And, and again, either there's something about the, the rose that's producing some sort of extra floral sugars, and, and those ants are always in those two. The other ones are fine. Well, which two? Which two? Well, that's a, well, it's just this pink one here. It's just, I don't even remember it was, but you know, it's really strange. The yellow ones next to it, the other ones, there are no ants. And so this is one that you know you might uh, you know actually, as you look at the, the roses, you actually see the ants in it. That one you might want to do something with it, soapy water or something, or take it out. Well, yeah, but I, yeah that's that's pretty.
Now, one of the things I fight all the time is I have all kinds of hummingbird feeders uh, along the back, and uh, I, I've, I've discovered a, a little trick that, that works pretty well. I take an old uh, sponge, here you can see my hummingbird feeder, and right up here at the top, I take an old uh, scrubbing sponge from the kitchen, and, and this is where I, I do use my wife's rig. <laughs> and, and I'll soak that in there and, and get it all sort of soaky and then let it dry. And, and this forms a pretty good repellent. But ants do not want to go across that. And so I don't have to put the oils and all of this other, you know, all of this other stuff and I don't have to treat, you know, down below. But it works pretty well. Pretty, pretty good. <laughs> other things that can be done, but I, I'll tell you, this, is, this isn't really all that effective. There's a lot of caulking and sealing. It is somewhat successful, you know. Uh, you know, it, it, the ants were pretty smart, though. They'll actually chew a hole through the caulking. <laughs> so if, if they want to get into the bathroom, you know, they want to get into the kitchen, they're going to chew a hole through it, you know. And so, you know, I've done a lot of this around the house, and it, it's just sort of, it's okay, you know. It, it makes you feel good when you're doing it. But, you know, a day or two later, you know, the ants will... If they want in, they'll, they'll just chew the, right through that, uh, yeah. the caulking material. Again, lots of plants around the, the home that just, yeah, queen palms, Chinese elm, lot, lots, of, lots of plants. And again, some of them have scales, some of them have mealy bugs and whatnot, and, and the ants just literally. And, and once they get in the tops of these trees, they're really hard to control. I mean, this is, this is a real challenge. There's no way you can spray those or you can you're sort of faced with the problem of you know what to do you know, as far as control and, and again it, it is a problem again these are the kinds of things that are conducive for carpenter ants velvety tree ant or whatnot you know what happens is again you know these these railroad ties as you can see the little the little stippling along here this indicates that these were pre pre-treated with the with the uh, uh, preservatives, typically quaternary salts, to prevent wood rot and insect attack. But what happens is, they, these, that, that even with uh, these little cleat marks in it, the penetration is usually only about an inch deep. The rest of the log on the inside is acceptable to insect attack and also attack by fungi. So what happens is, the ants will literally get into these and, and begin nesting on the inside. You know, the, the, the uh, wood preservatives or whatnot are not toxic to the ants. The ants won't eat it. Uh, they only live in the wood. They don't eat wood. So again, these are the kinds of things that can be pretty conducive here uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, ants and whatnot. So, you know, other approaches, as you might think about instead of using things like this, you might go to the composite woods, the plastic woods, you know, where it's a composite material made of plastic and wood, and those typically uh, the insects will not nest in, and, and termites won't feed them. So these are, again, uh, another thing here in the mountain areas, or down, when there's ever debris like this uh, on the roof or sometimes in the notches of trees and plants, this is a great place for Argentine ants. They love to nest in this kind of stuff. It's nice and moist, usually in the shade. It stays uh, you know, moist during the day. It makes a great uh, nesting site. And as I mentioned, the other thing is just trying to remove limbs and other things uh, from trees and whatnot as, as they uh, come over the structure. This is this, this, and the telephone lines, power lines, other things, uh, or garden hoses. You know, ants, uh, they take the easy way in, you know. They don't like to walk across the grass. They don't want to do things the hard way. They find the easy way. And so, you know, they'll go up a tree and it's the limb touches the top of the roof, they get off, you know, and then the leaf goes up, and they know they'll just wait. And, uh, again, so these ants are pretty clever, and uh, these are the kinds of things that can be done to sort of prevent uh, access to the attics and to upper parks. Now, you know, we've done a lot of work, spent a lot of time over the years in, in, in looking at sprays and, and baits and, and various types of, of granular uh, applications. And we'll get into a little bit of this, uh, more of this one when I talk about pesticide runoff. But, but again, uh, you know, really the, the most effective material right now on, on the market for 
as a spray, as a barrier type treatment, as a material called fipronil, or it comes by its trade name of Termidor. You know, it, it, uh, I guess people could buy this stuff online. It's typically, you know, what the pest control industry is using. They're allowed to apply it twice a year uh, around the structure. You're allowed to plow it, uh, apply it one foot up and one foot out all the way around the structure, and that's the only place you can use it. You can't use it in the yard or anywhere else. That's a pretty effective treatment <coughs> against Argentine ants. And uh, again, uh, uh, it, it, uh, as you'll see, it, it's not too much of a problem with pesticide runoff because it's a limited application. <coughs> now, other, other treatments that can be effective is here I'm applying some, some granular materials out in plant cover. So again, out in those areas where you have roses or you have trees, fruit trees, other things where the ants are, you know, tending aphids and everything, these are some places where granular applications have some utility. And, and again, our research has been able to show if you keep them out in those particular areas, they don't form a pesticide run on fish. The problem... Granular is just for protein. Well, no, no, but it, it, it's, it's a little different. It's not a bait. Now, a granular bait, like she's talking about, is something where the ant would go out, pick the bait up, and take it back to the nest, and then they would feed the larvae. Again, remember, I told you, the workers only can drink liquids. They can't feed on, on solids. So the worker ants that pick this up, what they do when they pick up a bug or they pick up a piece of protein is they run back to the nest, and they feed the larvae. And the larvae can feed on solid proteins, so like that solid bait. But this is a granular application. It's a particle that has a pesticide on the outside. So it's a granular formulation. The thing nice about it is when you use it is it stays put. In other words, if you put it in the soil or if you put it around the plant, it's going to stay put. It's not going to move and run and wash off. They typically use sand or something as a, as a, as a carrier. So yeah, a little different. Yeah, granules are a little different than, than granular baits. Mm -hmm. uh, does the Termidor or Pipinol, does it affect any beneficial insects? Well, you want to, yeah, and again, this is the reason that this one is, is regulated pretty carefully. Yeah, it, it, it has water profile problems. I mean, it is pretty toxic to little, you know, little crustaceans and things in water. Uh, it, it, it could, you know, be a problem for, for bees and whatnot. But again, you're only allowed to use it one foot up and one foot out. You can't use it anywhere else outside. Now this material, and so if any of you have pets, this is what's in front line. If you use front line on your pets to control ticks and fleas, that, that's what's in the Termidor. But it is really a quite effective treatment. And, uh, but again, as we'll talk in a minute, it, it, it's come under a lot of review and concern because they're beginning to find it in urban waterways. Mm -hmm. When you have ants in a vegetable bed, what's the safe thing to use? Because you don't want to well, contaminate your vegetables. I, I, would, I would always think first about the vegetables or whatever the plants that you have in there. I mean, if there are things that you're harvesting all the time, then obviously you want to be really careful what you spray. Um, if, if you knew what the ants were, maybe, um, you know, baiting would be a better approach. You could put it in a container. It would be confined. You know, even if it's a granular liquid bait, you don't have to scatter it. You could put it into a small <coughs> container and then let the ants go to it. But it, it'll depend on what the ant is. Yeah, Ar Argentines are going to be a problem finding a bait that they're going to take consistently. Again, I mean, this is just a, the typical approach here. And, and so this, this would have been that, that Termidor treatment. You can actually see it was up a foot and out a foot. That's it. You just can't use it anywhere else, or it shouldn't be used anywhere else. But again, it, it is actually pretty effective. And, and the industry really likes to use that, because they know that if they use it, that, you know, they're 95% you know, of the time, they're not going to have to come back for a couple months. So what would he be applying there in the bug? Well, that was probably a pyrethro of some kind. It could have been like bifenthrin or cyclothrin, one of the other types of pyrethroids where you're allowed to spray other parts of the structure or you're allowed to use it away from the structure. 
But I'm thinking we're going to talk about that in a minute, and, and you'll see that, that that now I think is I, I think is a, a poor choice. Spraying pyrethroids around the structure is probably not a good idea because it generates pesticide runoff. So yeah. Yeah, so here's again just another example. They, they would, so a, a typical, this happens to be up in the mountains and whatnot, but a typical house you'd use about a half a gallon, maybe three quarters of a gallon of this spray to get around the house, you know, 140 linear, that's linear foot home. You'd use about three quarters of a gallon. You'd love to use it once in the spring and once later in the summer, but only twice. You can't, can't use it any more than that. Now, I included this because, uh, again, red imported fire ants are on the move, but so is, so is this big headed ant. So if, if you find those, this is one in which the baiting techniques are, are actually pretty well developed and, and are actually pretty good. And, and this is what they often refer to as a Texas two step. What they mean by that, well, the, the idea is that, you know, these things sting, so if you jump on the mound, you're going to get stung, so that's how you get the two-step thing. But the two-step is it's, a, it's actually a, a two different uh, insecticides uh, baits are applied. What, what you typically do in this situation is you go out and you, you treat the mound the first time with something like Amdro, which is a granulized bait. It, it's on corn cobs. And... What, what they've done is they, they use a vegetable oil and they put this hydromethylon insecticide in the vegetable oil and then they, they soak the corn cob in it. So when the ant bites on the corn cob, it gets that liquid oil with the pesticide in it. The first one uh, that they'll often do is they'll give it an insect growth regulator. And what that does is the ants will suck on the oil, they take it back, and it sterilizes the queen and it sterilizes the new developing workers, the little larvae. Then, a couple weeks later, you put out the amdro, you put out the one that kills the workers, and then you finish off the colony. So it's a two-step approach. First we get the reproductive queen and the larvae, and then you get the adult. And, and, and it also works pretty well with this big-headed ant. So this is typically the approach we would go with these two ant species. Mm -hmm. What is the bait that you use two weeks later? Well, the first one, the first one is something that one of them is called like distance it, 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 or extinguish it. it. It has the insect growth regulator, and then later you come back with the product called Amdro. Usually, oh, that's, the that's the one with hydromethylmon. Yeah, you, you'll have this reference site. This one here, uh, this this, this uh, structural pest control board from Texas thing. It, it has the whole thing, you know, the whole consumer thing. It's really a great website. Does this work for the other fire ants? No, unfortunately, yeah. not very well. The native fire ant, no, it doesn't work too well. We tried to use that out on Coronado a couple times. So that one we, we typically do better with. Uh, there's an ant bait that uh, is made with silkworm pupae. So when they're in the silkworm industry, you know, and they're growing all these silkworms and whatnot, and, and, and the, the silkworm pupae, you know, they, they, they remove all the silk, and that's what you have in your clothes. But then the byproduct of that, they actually treat with that hydromethylmon, and, and, and our native fire ant really likes that. Well, ours are real aggressive. Whatever we, one we have are very aggressive. If you Ooh. mess with the nest, they, they go it, nuts. I, I would say it's probably this one. Well, they, they've been, I've been bitten, and it's... Well, well, yeah, you should send me... <laughs> and then I'll, and then I'll look at it. because if it is this, this, this andro, this other technique really works well. And you know, the only bad thing about this is maybe you can share the andro. You know, when you buy a bag of andro, it would be enough for everybody in here. You only need a teaspoon or two. Well, I have two and a half acres. Well, even well, you know, they say a half a pound per acre, but really the most effective thing is that is like this. It's a, it's a more targeted application. You know, in Texas, where they're treating thousands of acres, they usually put it on by truck or ATV or even a helicopter. Hmm. But but here, you know, you, you you would just go right near the sites and then and then just yeah fly and it. And what about our dogs? Yeah. Oh, you know, one thing about this 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 hydromethylmon bait that we really like is that if I I always recommend using it in the late evening. This stuff is photodegradable. 
de degrades quickly. So next morning when the sun comes up, if the sun hits the bait that the ants haven't taken, it, it'll be totally gone within you know, 18 hours, 12 hours. So no, I, I, I don't think you have to worry. Again, it's a, like I say, it's a corn cob with an oil in it. So, you know, yeah, I, I don't think you have to worry about that. But, but yeah, that's one thing I really like about the Amdro type bait is that it really does dissipate quickly. So you, you can throw it you know, on a golf course in the evening and in the morning, yeah, it's good. But again, really targeted approaches. And see, the thing about the baits are that you, you don't want to just use them necessarily as a scatter. As you, you want to target the application. You, you want to get near the nest sites. You, you want to put the bait right on the foraging line. I mean, you just don't want to, yeah, you just don't want to spread it around. And it, that's, that's one of the things that make it. So these are some things that over the last 10 years as we've been working with environmental scientists and doing all these pesticide monitoring studies and sort of what I call some good practices and some things to avoid. So one of the things I call by treating structural guidelines, if you're going to use some type of a liquid spray, you, you want to spray it along an edge. Let's say if this is the, the concrete driveway and this is the edge of the grass, you don't want to spray the grass, you don't want to spray the concrete, you want to treat the edge. Ants, most insects walk on edges. They do not walk out across the open. You don't usually see ants just wandering down the middle of something. They're almost always on edges. They, they have this edge tendency. Mm -hmm. So that's where you want to put your treatment. You don't want to spray it out in the dirt. You don't want to just waste all of the material. If you're going to use it, use it where it needs to go. So you want to treat structural guidelines. You want to totally avoid concrete, driveways, sidewalks, curbs, anything like that. Because if you treat those, I guarantee you, it's going to make the street and it will make the walk. So you want to avoid that. You want to tell people not to do that. Another one that we've been working on quite a bit, and instead of using a big, big fan spray, in other words, a big pattern, we, we try to make the pattern much tighter, what we call pin strips. In other words, the band may be two inches, not a foot up and a foot out. We do two inches up and two inches out. That's where the ant walks. The ant doesn't walk six inches up off the ground. It's going to walk right where the house and the ground meet. Or it's going to walk along underneath a shingle or something that there's something where it's in the shade. But So these structural guidelines, when we treat them much, much narrower. If you get away from the structure and you need to do some treatments, instead of spraying, I would recommend using some type of a granular material. It's going to settle down into the soil and not wash or be moved away. If you spray it, again, think about this. If you're spraying soil, if you're spraying mulch or whatnot, what you do as soon as that mulch or the soil dries and the wind comes along or a dust blower comes along or whatnot, you wind up just blowing it into the street. That's how these pesticides get moved around. They get moved around on particles. So we want to avoid that. And then again, when and if you can, incorporate baits. So like if we have red imported fire ant, we've got some great baits. If, if it's feral ant, we've got good baits. If it's a big-headed ant, we'll have good baits. Argentines, unfortunately, the, the baits aren't the best. You know, you can go online. There are some borate baits that can be made. But my caution to the borate types of baits is that usually they're too concentrated. They kill too quickly because they put too much boric acid in them. Half percent, quarter percent boric acid baits, you know, and 25% sugar water work pretty well. And that's something people can make. It's, it's, it's pretty safe and that uh, they don't need to. But again, uh, most of the things that you, you, you go to the grocery store, to Lowe's or whatnot, are not going to kill Argentine ants. First of all, most of them are sweet baits. They're not liquid baits. The few liquid baits that are on the market are usually too toxic. They kill ants within, you know, 15 or 20 minutes. What you want the ant to do, and as, I said, as somebody reminded me, as I told you that story, I guess, the last time, is that you know, when you're working with the bait, you want the baits to work as long as it can. So you have the ants visiting the station for like 24 hours, 48 hours, you know, because you want the toxicant to go back to the colony to kill the queen and the larvae. So that's always the challenge that you know, I have with my wife. 
Oh, well, she's, she's converted. She's totally in the baits. And she'll leave the bait alone now for 48 hours. Before, she'd see all the ants and she'd go, oh, well, I'm going to use a raid. I'll kill them all. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that defeats the purpose of the bait. Because you want the ants to take the toxic and back to the nest. So, so uh, again, I mean, uh, when possible, you know, the baits are really good. Recipe again for making your own? Well, yeah. Well, 20, yeah, so if, if you add 100 milliliters of water, you need like 25 grams of sugar. That give you 25% sucrose water. And then you would put like a half a gram of boric acid into that. And probably the thing, if you were going to make it, I would do is first heat the water, then mix in the sugar, and then mix in the, the boric acid. But I wouldn't make it any strong. I wouldn't put any more boric acid in that in Keep, you want to keep that down because you want the ants to feed them. Mm -hmm. um, the, the boric acid, can you use the borate that you buy for laundry or you have to get something different? Than no, I, I've never tried that. Okay. The thing I would be afraid of is there's something, these ants are really sensitive to chemicals. Okay. So, you know, what I often find when we do our research is that we'll, we'll, we'll make up a bait in sugar water and, and we'll, we'll mix it up. And then the chemical companies, of course, then they're, they're trying to develop something that will sit on the shelf for like a year. So they start putting in all kinds uh, of anti-fungus materials and whatnot. And then the ants won't drink it. Yeah. That's why I say that, you know, the, the simpler, the better. Yeah. You know, and but you can buy boric acid. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah you can. Uh, and, and, or you could, you know, probably... Uh, you know, like a can of roach proof, is, uh, that stuff is like 98% or 99% orthoboric acid. See? But then you'd have a whole pound, and all you need is like a little teaspoon, you know. So, yeah. But yeah, you're, you're going to have to warm the water, though, to get it to go in solution. Uh, warm water, will, the, the maximum uh, solution would be about 5%. Mm -hmm. So if the Argentine ant's the number one ant in California, uh -huh. you get a lot of questions about it. Are mm -hmm. you saying... The, there's no way really to buy over the counter a bait that's going to work. So basically, it's raid. No, I, I, again, you know, it's again the the, the, the the boric acid bait is is not registered. There are some boric acid baits that they can buy. There are some boric baits that can buy, and, but they and they're they're, they're, they're okay. Yeah, they're okay. They could be better. Okay. You know, you you could live with that. Um, you know, there's also, you know, some other baits that are on the market, but, you know, and I, see, I'm telling you things you shouldn't do, because, like, I, I would dilute them. You know, like, there's a product called Hot Shot, and it's got a material in it, Dinotefron. Well, the Dinotefron's pretty good, but the problem is it's too toxic. So, you know, the, the, what's on the shelf right now needs to be diluted a thousandfold. Wow. Yeah, see, that. Uh, you see, that's one of the problems. Everyone likes to see, you know, in, inside insects like die instantly. You know, it's like the thrill of the kill. You know, like, the thing is death. Well, baiting, that's not what we want to do. So it, it's like even with the industry, you know, and trying to get the industry to develop baits, they can't get beyond this mindset that, you know, just want to see the thing die. Like, right now. Yeah, and that, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I've been using for a number of years a product called Taro. Yeah, Taro has boric acid in it. And it seems to be very successful. Yeah, it's pretty good. It takes, I, it takes a couple weeks. It takes a couple weeks. And, and if that were diluted a little bit, in other words, it's still, it's still yeah, it's still a little on the strong side. If that were diluted a little better, it would even work better. Yeah. Yeah, borates take a while to, to, for it to ultimately work. But you see little black circles of the ants. Oh, I know. They yeah, they love to drink it. Yeah, that's what you want. The more drinking, the better. Okay, you dilute it. Getting to a habitat modification, uh -huh. specifically for something like this. Uh huh. Would something a product like Tanglefoot be good, or is, is that too easily bypassed? No, yeah, no. That's the Tanglefoot and these kinds of sticky products can be used. I mean. You know, obviously, if you know, if you had a commercial operation, it's impractical. But around the house, it would be more practical. They're going to have to replace it occasionally. These ants are pretty clever, you know. And, and what they'll do is they'll start getting little twigs and sticks and whatnot, and they'll start placing it on the band, and they'll build themselves a bridge across it. 
And so what you just have to do is it has to be replaced. Yeah, you know, when I, when I trap cockroaches outdoors, that's one of the biggest problems. They, they realize that they're cockroaches in the traps, so the ants will actually build bridges across the sticky trap to get to the cockroach to take it apart. So yeah, but it will work. Yeah, these, those kinds of mechanical barriers work. The, the problem is, is that it's just, you know, it's something that the homeowner could do, probably, on a limited basis. But it would be impractical for like a citrus grower. They, they, they could just never do something like that. Uh huh? She had a science fiction movie then? Oh, absolutely. Oh, it's my favorite. Well, you know, the next time you watch that, though, you know, it's really, it, it's called yeah. them, you know, and they, yeah. the ants get in the, the LA sewer basin, yeah. you know? Well, the thing is they've been nuked, you know, from the yeah, actually, what's really funny about that movie is, is that they, you know, they have this guy who's like the ant expert of the world, you know, but he, it, it, he misidentifies the ant, you know, first of, all, first of all, the ant is a carpenter ant, and it, and it doesn't have a stinger, you know, so it's, it's pretty funny, but I use that one all the time, yeah. And if you remember that, how he killed the ant is he used a submachine gun to shoot off the antennae. That's great. So there's another alternative. You know, you can recommend homeowners to use their firearm. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's a great movie. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I show that to my students all the time, you know. This sounds like a good time to take it. All right. <laughs>